First of all, I'm absolutely delighted um, and really quite honoured to come today and talk about um, compulsive skin picking. Um, I'm also doing a session this afternoon with Colette about getting the best treatment and how to get that and what good, good treatment is in this country specifically, even though Catherine said some of the same things, but I, we're going to do lots of questions. Just to let you know, I'm, my name's Simon Darnley. I am a cognitive behaviour psychotherapist. I'm also head of um, clinical pathways for Lambeth um, in all their various treatments and services. And I was, for many years, the head of the Anxiety Disorders Residential Unit, which is a specialist unit at the Bethlehem and Morsley that specialises in um, residential treatment for um, OCD and BDD. And I have had a lifelong um, interest in OCD, BDD, and um, also contributing around that particular habit disorders, including um, things like trichotillomania, um, um, other habit disorders, but especially um, skin picking, compulsive skin picking as well. And we know, of course, that compulsive skin picking is uh, quite a common feature, as we saw this morning, in BDD. So I'm going to talk about um, some of the differences about compulsive skin picking, it in BDD, and then the treatment, and we're going to focus on the treatment as well. Um, I only really work best if I get loads of questions. Okay, so there's, there is, it's, um, if people want to ask questions, then please, you can write them down, or you can stop me at any time and ask questions, therefore you get the best out of me, because sometimes... Um, I to talk too much and maybe not say what you want, okay? And I'm also willing to talk to people afterwards if necessary as well. That's not a problem. Okay, if people are willing, who's happy to put hands up if they are a sufferer of chronic skin picking? Excellent. And keep your hands up if you also have BDD. Okay. Um, hands up if you're relatives. Excellent. And hands up if you're just interested people. Okay. And hands up if you're in the wrong room and you want to leave them. <laughs> no? Excellent. Okay. So there's quite a lot of people who have um, compulsive skin picking and BDD and also have BDD themselves and relatives. Excellent. Okay. That's good. Okay. Um, also, throughout this, you'll see um, a, a, a lot of the art, and this is one of them as well, by Liz Atkin. Liz Atkin is an artist who had um, chronic skin picking and um, is a professional artist who um, all our arts around performance and movement and also producing some really good stuff on um, chronic skin pick and all the artwork is, is taken from her. She's allowed us to use it today as well. Excellent, okay. Hi. Thanks for coming. You missed the best bit already, but it's okay. And go over it. That was it. Okay, compulsive skin picking. It's called lots of different things. And you may see these names. Um, I can't even say them. I have slight dyslexia. And uh, so therefore, to, I can always, I can, it's like, you know, for years, I didn't even know Hermione in Harry Potter was actually pronounced Hermione. Because I'd read it, uh, but I never actually heard it said. And it was like, what is that? Hormone? Anyway, so <laughs> same about the dermatelia, psychotic exhalation, pathological skin picking, the expression. Um, it's not, there's lots of names for it in some ways as well. But what is it? Okay, what it is, is... It's actually where people really currently skin pick, and it often can result in skin lesions. Um, there's lots of attempts um, to, to, to decrease or stop the skin picking. So people do have insight about this aspect that, oh, no, I know I shouldn't have done that as well, that skin picking causes real distress and a huge impact on life. Um, and what's also important, it's not attributed to effects of other drugs or, or medical conditions as well. Uh, often when I, I, I talk about this, people say, oh, yeah, I worked with somebody who had... Um... Oh, no, that's just up my anxiety. Thank you very much for coming. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't see it at the front as well. Oh, no. Oh, no, it's like being at school and being marked now. <laughs> oh, that was... Oh. No, I've got really anxious. I was doing OK. <laughs> oh, why did you do... Oh, OK. I'll go... Can't go see David or something. Oh, no, OK. It's lovely to have you here. Oh, great. Okay. So, what was I saying? So I've lost my train. Okay. So, yes, because I'll sometimes people who... Um, I, I work with a lot of people, nurses or specialists in drugs and alcohol, and they say, oh, yes, we have people who are on cocaine, and they do this as well. I say, no, it's very different here. It's very different, the, the kind of way it works, and also what you need to do about it as well. So, what we do know, it's, it's actually fairly common, skin picking, and it's kind of common from a kind of very mild to going to very, very severe. It's a common feature in BDD, and it's sometimes a feature in OCD as well. 
And it also can be associated with other habit disorders. Sometimes people put it in with these, with, with, with hair picking, hair pulling, like what we call trichotillomania as well, or something called bruxism. Does anybody know what bruxism is? It's kind of like, it's where teeth grind and clenching, right? Or people grind their teeth, sometimes that's going to be as well. So, uh, uh, or even Gilda de Tourette's, where people often have uh, various jerks or um, noises that they make because of uh, like a tick disorder as well. So kind of habit tick disorders can be seen in the same sort of area. But within BDD, of course, that we know, as I explained this morning, it's quite a high percentage of people actually go have skin picking as part of the BDD problem itself. Okay. So this is Liz again. Someone's... So, we look at the, the what, how, where, when, triggers and impact. Now, what I was hoping for, and you lot are very quiet, and I realise you've been sitting quietly and listening, and I really wanted these kind of smaller groups for, is for you to be part of that process, really, if you're willing to. Um, and you have to talk about yours, it's just what you think as well, about the kind of what is picked in that sense as well. Anybody willing to contribute, first of all, what people, what is the problem? Yes, go for it. Hello, your name is, if you don't mind? I'm, oh, Lisa's good, but I was actually looking, Lisa, that's okay, Lisa, I'll go to you, but I was going for, I will, and then I'll go to Lisa. Hi, Safran. So therefore, ah, okay, so you come straight to something really important about when you do have some, uh, a skin problem and it becomes itchy and then it's of course you scratch it and then the issue of when you scratch it, it makes it worse and then of course then it makes it more scratchy and that itch scratch cycle goes round and round, doesn't it, as well. And that's why people have eczema as well, we can do the same thing. The habit reversal will help that a lot. And of course, I take it you're having treatment for the skin problem as well, or special creams or whatever for that. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. So therefore, it's that actually what's really helpful then is I suppose the help with the scratch itch cycle that goes round and round. It can become very difficult. I, know, I understand that. That's really good. Okay. So what is when you're saying okay, I have some a um, skin condition, and of course, if it gets itchy, then I scratch it as well. So that's really common. I am looking at you now. Lovely person. Um, well, I, didn't, I don't know if I've got BDD, but sitting listening, um, it's a bit... So I'm, I'm, I'm in a bit of shock at the moment. But I have um, had... It's mainly on my back, or yep. my face, um, and I'm actually, at the moment, I've gone on to appeal to reduce because my skin gets really itchy and scratch but if I get very stressed as well yep. I would you know if it's a stressful situation I would um, you know I find anything and one big thing at the moment I think I've gone for the back, back spine but it's really scarred or whatever yeah sure. and that's why I say it gets to a point where the impact of life is it scratches and it may cause lesions it kind of cuts and then they become imperfections or deformities and things as well and that's what happens yeah but I've got it's my eyebrows now and eyebrows yeah so that's, that's good. So we know it's things like pimple scabs, bites, kind of like maybe mosquito bites, or maybe there's something there, but we a slight imperfection or not at all, where sometimes there's even a feeling of things where there's kind of pores and there's bumps or maybe small black dots or small white dots we look for, or, or, or things we perceive as, oh, that's an ugly thing, I need to pick that up, cyst. Um, so that's the kind of what as well, and so there. The how is often using the fingernails, of course, and actually there may be kind of picking or squeezing. But often other things are used, like this, like this morning was an example of people who use tweezers and pins, razor blades. I don't know, people use, um, go on to kind of like staple removers or gouges, knives, things like that. Uh, some people have a kind of little kit of kind of equipment as well that can be used in that sense as well. Where, on the, where um, this is what I've got said about that as well, is often the face is the number one site. See, I think it's the most it's our skin sites. I think it's the reason why it's number one. It's the most visible pl place all the time out there as well. So it's number one sites as well. But then common is back, the neck, scalp, ears, chest, cuticles um, are quite common as well. I have a bit of skin picking as well. I suddenly got interested in it because I used to, um, and I'm nervous, I pick like this until it bleeds often. 
but it's very, very minor and, not, and doesn't impact my life. Except sometimes I'm doing a talk and I realise there's blood on, on the, my hand out. So I'm going, oh no, I'm actually kind of bleeding on my hand because I've got anxious as it's gone on and I'm, I'm bleeding on my hand out. So I have to go, yeah, we, ha- we haven't got enough handouts today. And I'm kind of going, woo, it looks a bit weird. So. so in the moment, I'm doing okay. But you can see if I suddenly start getting like this, you know, it's not going to. So I'm looking for your smiles and encouragement. Okay, so we know that's quite common, hands and legs as well. Um, within the, even though BDD is 60-40, there are proportionally seems to be more females with, with, with skin picking than males as well. Um, often, so that's the where, where the, and the triggers. When people like to, anybody going to talk about their triggers or willing to say, yes, your name is? Um, Helen. Helen, thank you, Helen. Go for it. I think, um, well, when I was adolescent, I think I was really sensitive. You know, the TV adverts for uh, like cosmetics and creams would always do these folk, um, you know, um, um, what are they called? Uh, you know, they'd give the detailed image of like the breakdown of the skin and pores. Oh right, so yes. Then I think I kind of took that on, and you know, and then overfocus on the details that to others weren't visible, and. Um, yeah, then became, you know, became uh, skin picking on my face and been um, like that for 20 years now. Right. So you took an image, you thought, that's how my skin should be. That's kind of like, and you looked yeah, at that. Yeah, because there are all these, yeah. you know, they talk about, you know, your skin should be blemish-free. Yeah. And the idea that there would, there's something wrong, there's something kind of lurking, you know, because they draw these massive pores, where it's actually, you know, it's very natural and there was nothing mm-hmm. wrong with my skin. Um, but that kind of um, latched onto the anxiety. But somehow uh, my skin is like that. I need to be talking about my yeah, pores, exactly. I need to talking about my skin, I mean, and it's, it's like, like yeah, uh, absolutely. With my eyesight becoming worse. Right. So that I, there was this kind of, um, you know, disjointed perception of myself that, you know, something I needed glass, so I took them off, and then I'd look too close, and then I'd always look too close. Yeah, and if you look too close, of course, we know from this morning you tend to focus in on those things rather than actually seeing the whole beautiful you. You just focus on that teeny little bit and that's all you see. I think if anybody goes to David's session um, this afternoon about images and, and drawings of people with BDD and things, it's really, really interesting that people just see themselves as a nose or an eye or, or some sort of perfection. They don't actually see any of the other things. They so can't focus on that and it's doing that as well. Um, and we know this happens in, 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 in different disorders as, as, as well. I, I um, used to work with people with eating disorders, and I remember very vividly, um, and it's, I think, a very similar thing. This, this, this young, young person with anorexia going to get a changing room, she got changed, and she saw somebody, uh, what she thought was in the shared changing room. She went, oh, my God, look at that person there. She said, if I ever get as thin as that, I'm going to do something about it. And then she realised it was a mirror. <laughs> And she was so shocked that it was, it was a mirror in a change room that just happened to fit like a door, a fancy one. So she's like, oh my God, that was me. And she suddenly had this perception of, oh. And just for that second, it was out of it. So often we know from this morning that, in fact, you know, you may, you, you, it's really, really hard to have that perception of, do you know what? It's, this is not necessarily real. My perception of things aren't the, aren't the reality because it feels totally real. And you will feel it. That sense of self will feel, no, you don't understand, Simon. You don't understand. You may be the first, but you are wrong. This is real. And I have to say about this. And I am somehow, it is a blemish. It's wrong. I'm ugly. Why can't people see it? We're often really exasperated. Why can't people see this? So thank you for that. I appreciate that. It's a lot. Um, so often, you're absolutely right, often p- um, people do this, they may do it standing in front of a mirror, when alone. We know that often it's tr- triggered by various things, not just stress, boredom, or, or triggered by feeling something minor, or even real, if it's, if it's an itch as well. The other thing that often happens is people kind of search, so it's kind of like a searching and smoothing as well, or comparing, comparing sides and things like that as well. As well. And yes, go for it. Twice today. I, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything specific on that. I do know we, we did some research on people coming for treatment, and it tends to be more uh, women than men as well. That's generally the case for, I think, all treatments and stuff as well. Um, we know BD, BDD is about 60, 40. Um, with compulsive skin picking, it tends to be um, females. That may be a factor. But I think 
Um, in, in my lifetime, in working with BZ, I worked with David when he was just an S, a, a kind of junior doctor type thing. We were working for many years together. Um, I know the increase in, in male BZ has, has increased massively. And also, in my lifetime, I've now started using moisturiser. I didn't when I was 30, and now I'm using it when I was 50. Suddenly, we're all expected to. My son is 22. He's using moisturiser all the time. I was thinking, whoa, he's kind of, suddenly it's like male grooming is a really improved thing, isn't it? It's suddenly really on the rise, and we're selling it, and it's all trendy, kind of like silver layers. It's, kind of, it's done in a male way, kind of like to these things as well. So there is an increase, I think, in that sense. So you may be right about some of that. Um, so... There's often a, a sense of relief or sometimes even enjoyment about that process at that time, and that relief may be very short-lived. It can be kind of just that sense of kind of, a, a kind of feeling there of the kind of things, I, I kind of need to do this and I'm sure I can get this right. But unfortunately, of course, the impact is that we know that as soon as that happens, afterwards, what happens? We can feel hopeless, it gets us really down, we get shame, we get guilt, and it, and it kind of comes down really massively. And, we kind of, and also that sense of I've lost control again about this process can be really hard as well. Yes, go for um, it. Um, also, then it gets into a cycle yes. of obsession about damage. You know, yeah. I've finally done it, I've really damaged my skin this time, I've ruined it, yeah. and then you know, all the repercussions on your actual life, you know, avoiding things, like yeah. that would be unable to get to lectures or exams or parties, you know, massive impact. I, I, it does, and that stops people, and that's what it's, it stops you going out. Often people um, will then avoid work, take time off sick, or just, just avoid people in, in contact as well, avoid relationships, avoid lo so many things, keep covered up. Um, I treat somebody with compulsive skipping it, she would only go out at night to walk. She had, to, she had a dog, so she was living alone, and she would only go out at night to walk a dog. Of course, nowadays, unfortunately, with the internet, we can order our shopping in, we can do all these things in. And she said, I'm coping because I only go out at night. But that also is quite harder in the summer. It's harder and harder. It's like in the summer, it's light till nearly 11 sometimes. And you're thinking, and she wasn't able to go out until it was completely pitch black. And even then, with a big um, hat on and, and covered up, and nobody could see, and then she could walk the dog. Yes. Okay, does anybody want to have a shot at that? Go for it. Um, I used to get quite fed up that yeah, like, well I used to go to a doctor or a therapist, they'd always um, yeah. give me this thing of, you know, is it like cutting the sudden mm. relief? Like, you know, it's like no, it's I don't feel relieved, but it's the line I would always be given. Yeah, uh, and I totally agree. We know it's one of the myths of a compulsive skin picking as well, that people try and, uh, and link it to self-harm and that as well. There isn't. We know that the, kind of, that the reason people often think is because they feel they're going to improve their skin. Okay. It's not to hurt yourself because of some difficulty as a distraction to the kind of inner turmoil you have. Another thing is, um, one of the things I do uh, as another part of my job is I, I, I do work with people with, with self-harm uh, um, in doing um, DBT. And it's very different to the work I do with CBT and these things. It's very, very different and very different person as well. But I know that often people with skin picking, because sometimes the effects of it can be so harsh as well. People will go down that route of a kind of self-harm and link it to people who, who cut or burn themselves as well. It's not necessarily like that at all for the vast majority of people. So that's kind of a good a, a myth. I'm glad you've asked because I hopefully dispelled that. Anybody disagree? Looking at the prof, it's okay. It's okay, yes, go. Yes. <laughs> You're disagreeing, Megha. Uh, I, I wonder, is it not like a form of self mutilation, though, to self care? Um, because, you know, I've, I've suffered from skin mm -hmm. And, you know, I knew very well what the repercussions were going to be. And I think I reached a point where I was just like, you know what, I don't care. And I felt like I wanted to do damage to myself because I hated my appearance so mm -hmm. much. For, for very small people, that may, may be the case, but the majority of people with skin picking, the skin picking is actually there, especially in BDD, is there to actually try and, and improve what's going on and try and deal with that issue as well, or to relieve the itch or to do that. So there's actually that link is made, it, rather than actually something to, to harm yourself particularly. But also, of course, it may get... I can understand for you why it got to that stage. I suppose I don't know. I, for the majority of people, that wouldn't have started like that. It wouldn't have started that you set out to harm yourself. Yeah, no, that's, I would agree with it. it didn't start like that, but maybe subconsciously it was. I, I don't know. 
I, I would note this. That I would suppose I, dis I agree with that. We would disagree. We would look for the fact that people often with skin picking are looking for um, trying to improve it. Okay, or it becomes, in some ways, it can become a habitual as well. So I know when I'm bored or, or when I'm slightly stressed, then it triggers. I, I'm more likely to trigger this. I get a slight stutter, and also I, I get I can start scratching as well. And I know very likely, there's, when we come to the next one, I come to you, I haven't got you as well, is that there's two types of skin picking, which is one is automatic. So sometimes it's kind of like a pre-conscious level of skin picking. And we kind of only spot it when we're actually something's happening. We think, oh no, we're starting to bleed now. So to me, I, I don't realise how it's bleeding. But people can, that can happen. Or there's actually a focused time. So I... I I've seen many people who actually kind of say, well, I've taken, I'm going off sick, and they kind of, they kind of have this urge to skin pick because they found something, and they go home, I, that's it, they go up to the bedroom, door's locked, they're by themselves, they've known they've got a couple hours, and they will then pre-plan a, a session, if you like, as well, with the aim of, I need to do this to do something. It's not to self-harm themselves, but actually to try, and there's a, there's, it's either a compulsion, a habit to, to carry out. And with BDD, often it's like, if I can just get that right... In some ways, if I can just clean that out, it'll be okay. Yes? Um, I, I, um, I do suffer from skin picking, but I've also, um, in the past, had uh, the compulsion to start harm. And the, um, the difference that I could say between the two is that um, with skin picking, it's more like a kind of comfort thing. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, just kind of trying to yes. soothe, self soothe, whereas with self harm, it's like a scream. <laughs> such a kind of high impact of um, anxiety mm -hmm. that it's, it's not really comfort, it's just a desire to do something to get rid of that kind of that intensity, whereas mm -hmm. with skin picking it's slightly different. I, I, I tend to agree, if you look at t and the continuum, there would be of course an end where um, skin picking to harm and self-harm behaviour may cross over, but it would be on a continuum and it would be at, at one end. The vast majority wouldn't be in that category as well. So you can characterise that like that. Somebody else? Yes? No, I was just going to say that, um, like, um, that maybe I also have problems with self I've got borderline personality disorder as well as the yep. feeling. You can kind of tell the difference between Good. the feeling and the self-harm. Like, it is, for me anyway, it's completely different, completely different reasons. Yep. And with the feeling, it's not a release. Like, no. So there may be some comforting during it, but it's actually not necessarily released, and there's a difference. Yeah. Thank you, people. <laughs> yes, again. Yeah, I wanted to say that there's a kind of uh, a mix in that there's a focus, you know, the, the, this attempt, you know, obviously, um, you know, um, misconstrued them to try and correct something. You think you correct it by, by scratching it. But also, the physical act is somehow soothing and comforting, and it lets your mind wonder. So I'd often, you know, it drifted on, and, and my mind would be going yep. a bit there. And we know that happens in a habitual manner, which is why this can, has been uh, categorised onto habit disorders. I often use the example of popcorn. I've, I've lost weight, but I'm still overweight. But I know, you put me for a big bucket of popcorn and I'm watching a film, it's almost habitual. I don't really realise it. I think, oh, it's gone. What happened there? Somewhere in there, I've kind of, it, the kind of behaviour has become slightly uh, kind of, Semi conscious level, does that make sense? It's like driving, isn't it? Oh, I can't think, I, I can talk and drive now quite competently, but I actually think, oh, that's so, as well. so it becomes the actual behaviours become very focused. Also, that kind of zoned out yes, is yes, quite kind of yeah. it can be. But the problem with that is, of course, once we stop, the relief of that doesn't last very long, and then, it, and of course, there's a whole horrible kickback of the shame and the embarrassment and the, the hopelessness and that bit about, oh no, what have I done? I've gone too far now, as well. And and we know, because we look at, when you look at the history of people with skin picking, it, there is that thing about it gradually getting worse. It may have started like this, and then we suddenly found, oh, we did use it at work, we used the stapler because it was suddenly there, a staple, and, then we thought, and then before we know it, we've actually graduated to worse and worse and worse things, and it's got worse and worse. So suddenly you have a specialised toolkit that you've got with gouges and knives and various things and little tools that you can buy from <laughs> boots and things, and it gets worse. And you think, wow, suddenly, how did this start? It didn't start like that, but it's gradually got worse in the focusness of that as well. Okay. Um, so it may start in pre-consciousness, but it can be focused. There can be planned focus picking. What's important is that only 20% of people with skin picking problems know, are aware that treatment's available. Okay. And there is. So some of the differences um, I've said, we talked about, but it's actually 
Um, about 30 to 45 people with BDD also have skin, skin picking problems. Um, people with chronic skin picking outside of BDD don't pick their skin with a view of improving the appearance of the skin. So quite a lot of people just have it as um, a habit disorder. It may start in the same similar vein as nail biting or hair pulling as well, just in itself. So it's not necessary to make the skin better. It's just that there's something there and I'll just keep going at it. So a lot of people I treat don't have BDD. Um, with CSP, it's mainly females. Um, BDD has a good response to SSRIs, you saw this morning. Um, with, with, just with CSP alone, the evidence is mixed. So if you don't have BDD, you just have that, the evidence is mixed with SSRIs. There isn't actually some brilliant research on that as well. And there's a higher rate of other habit disorders, such as the hair pulling, which is trichotillomania, with just CSP alone. Um, and often, so people with CSP have a family history as well. They'll say, oh yeah, somebody in the family also used to pick or do something as well like that. My dad had the same thing. He had a bleeding thumb all his life. And I wonder why, but now I know. Okay. Any questions so far? Commercial chance. No, Simon, you've said everything we want to know. Okay. okay. We're going to go for treatment. This is another brilliant piece of art from Liz as well on that as well. So what are the challenges in treatment? Uh, there were quite a lot. So what other challenges do you think is actually yourself or people getting access to treatment? Lack of knowledge. Thank you. Did you read my slides? It's good. Well done. So limited public and professional awareness. Absolutely the case. And people then mislabeling as things. We said that already. Is that what you were going to say? No, I was going to say um, CBT. Oh, sorry. Go on, go for it. See if it's the next one. that isn't specific to BDD can only help to a certain point and, and doesn't really help with the... Yes. And also, then also, the actual training of people in, in, habit, in, in actually doing um, habit reversal as well, for this treatment specifically for this as well. Um, we had, there was a European, there's a European habit disorders group, and we, we trained in that for particular habit disorders with, with um, Tourette's and stuff as well, and you could have treatment for that. A lot of people now on CBT courses in this country don't get um, trained in the treatment for habit disorders. Um, I, I teach on various CBT courses at the Institute of Psychiatry and also usually as a guest speaker around and they often get me in kind of after the course to say oh we're interested in habits all this time can you come and do a session on that but it's not seen as the core, as the core training it, it, it doesn't take much if you're good at underlying the basis of CBT you can take the principles and you can develop them and also you can get the manuals, which I like the idea of saying, the, taking the manual to a therapist, so that's a good idea to say, what about using this now? And I will be giving you, at the end of today, a competing response monitoring form and a, skip, a skin picking monitoring form as well to take away so you can use your basis as well. So you can, think, you can have the start of that as well. So the, a big thing, though, a, a big challenge in treatment, of course, is, is the embarrassment and shame of the whole thing as well. Uh, and just, it's just cringy and embarrassing to talk about it for some as well. Um, it's often diagnosed wrongly, and often GPs may minimise the severity and impact on people's life as well. By the very nature, I haven't forgot you, by the very nature, you're probably only going to see a GP when you feel you're able to, so they won't necessarily see you at the worst, which is a real problem. Yes? Um, I have to say, I'm a therapist, and when I try to work with people with skin picking, I find that it's harder people are quite attached to the soothing... Nature of it. Yeah. That can be as well. So, so there's limited good treatment available as well. And I think that's quite hard to get. In this country, as you may be aware, we have the kind of IAP service of people who have who are CBT trained as well. Often in there, it's quite hard to get people who are, have the training in habit disorders or particularly in CSP. It's also quite hard to get people who are BDD specific, by the way, as well. Um, BDD is not done as a lot of the core training because it's seen as actually quite complex. And it's usually something that people do afterwards. So you're looking for a more experienced person who has had that BDD training. Um, of the, when you do a CBT course, you have to do various cases. You have to kind of like hand in and write up various cases um, of which BDD isn't one of them because it's seen as, as, as actually complex and actually needs a, a, a kind of much more un, um, a therapist who understands that specifically. And it tends to be on things like the, the kind of more common disorders like depression and things like that. That's what you would do. So BDD isn't necessarily on the syllabus at the base level for, in this country for CBT. So when, that's a really important bit of knowledge. Also, well, I was going to say this afternoon. It's important to know that. So when you go and get your therapist, you don't have to be worried about saying, 
sorry, this person's not enough trained, I need somebody with more specific skills in BDD or in the treatment of this. It's absolutely fine, it's your right to do that, and you should do that. You all gonna promise me you're going to do that? Yes, you do. So, yes? I, I, I run the uh, OCD support group for David Fear Priory. Yes. Years ago. Now, I work with Barnet Boys for Mental Health, so I work on boards at Itchwell and Barnet. And our problem is, as you know, with lack of funding, our CBT therapists just they are very, very basic and they give eight to ten sessions. Yeah. And I mean, it's not their fault, but there's nothing we can do because we're, we're cutting funding. So I always sign those into the Maudsley, and then we have the problem that um, they're not given funding, and yep. I have to get OCD action advocacy. It's, yep. it's, it's, it's a constant problem. It is a constant problem, but it's one you do need to keep fighting. And it's, I know I do that in my session this afternoon about actually, I've seen for many years now people who it's so frustrating at all different levels, but you need to do that. Um, when I was last head of the ADRU unit, the new head's going to be there this afternoon. Um, I think I had about six or seven complaints in a year who would write to their, to their MPs. When they write to their MPs, suddenly funding was there. It was amazing how that happened when they've been trying to get funding for ages. Don't be afraid to use your rights and actually what you need to do to complain. The advocacies are really good in getting that. But I need to go back to this. Is that okay? Excellent. So we're looking at non-CBT approaches now for CSP specifically. There's a whole range of them. Um, some of them may be useful, but by themselves, I wouldn't recommend them at all. Okay. Um, with medication, SSIs are useful when there's BDD present, but for CSP alone, no drug has really been identified as effective or approved for CSP alone. Okay, I know there's a brilliant session this afternoon on medication. If you want more medication for BDD, with CSP alone, it can maybe help if you have depression or things, but not for it alone. So it's, it is useful and it is important to have that if you have BDD. Okay, we're, see, we're doing well, we're about halfway through, and there's my halfway through point to remind me to slow down. This was and to say anything else that questions, yes, correct. I'm sorry, um, when you say there's no drug that's been identified for CSP alone, yeah. There has been some trials, and the theories have been mixed as well. They've often tried um, SSRIs. They try those first line ones. They haven't been really that great. There are some drugs that are helpful for very severe Tourette's as well. Sometimes people use um, things like haloperidol and various things like that, but not really. You're going to say there is now. Yes. The problem is, as you just said, is the trials aren't very good. Yeah. It's, it's very expensive to do what we call an adequately parallel medication trial. Yeah. And you subjects in it to drive. Yep. So a lot of these trials are just very tiny right. and not even big enough power to, there are enough people to even be able to figure out if, if the medication is better than a placebo, for example. Yeah. So I think the thinking of most experts, uh, med experts in this area is an SRI is probably worth trying, and as you said, especially if it's BDD. Then definitely. That is the first line medication, yep. and often at higher doses, and the compulsive behaviors usually get better, including the skin picking. But we also recommend habit reversal in addition. Um, but also something called NCL cysteine. Yeah. If anyone in this room has tried that, a couple of grams a day, but maybe start long. It's a, it's a natural the agent that you can buy at the <coughs> store and hopefully try and find a pure brand. Um, can you say that but, again? The name it's the, NAC. Oh, NAC. And a single cysteine. It's, again, that's not well studied either. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a probably pretty harmless substance. It's a natural kind of substance. And, you know, it's... Maybe worth a try, but habit reversal is sort of the best established. Yeah, and, and that's what... Some people like to try the NAC. Absolutely. I, 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 wherever they say, I suppose I was going to try and push the habit reversal heavily. Yeah, yeah, I see yeah. the first slide, <laughs> and then people say, oh, let's go for NAC, because the habit reversal is going to be the harder, more difficult thing, the, more, the, more, the thing you have to put the effort in as well. And, and, and why do people go that way rather than actually doing something that actually can make a real big difference, and, but it needs to have a, be a priority on you, and it needs to actually say, OK, I'm going to really try this. So I suppose I'm... Focus on that, but that is helpful. Yes. Hi, so, I would agree with um, other people saying that I do think that it can be a meditative state or a hypnotic state yep. that you get into when picking. So yep. It can be hard to get. You can get almost addicted to Absolutely. That sort of focused yep. attention. My question is about acne. Is there more of a correlation by people who are affected by acne that spit? The pick? No, not necessarily. People, people may have um, minor blemishes or acne as well, but, some, but often people don't have any. 
as well. Or there may be kind of, like I said, all the various things, they may just have a, a small pimple or a small imperfection as well. Especially like cuticles, I don't get acne things, but it's like that, there's a bit of skin there that I suddenly think, oh, do you know what, that's a bit of skin just needs to come off. And then before I know, I've kind of gone all the way down, sometimes down to here. It's like, it's not good. It's, like, it's not good, but it's just like, okay, yep. So there isn't a correlation. No, not so. Of course, people with acne, sometimes people with acne, like uh, they would, if it, they have a, a minor acne, then they're going to focus on that as their bit. But the skin picking itself, once you're into that loop, you're absolutely right, it can become hypnotic, which is why the habit reversal is so important when we come to that, because you're trying to do it at the pre stage. You're trying to get that complete awareness. Once you're, it's like, Anything, you be, have aware. If you're having anger management, it's no good when, you're when you've actually hit the person. You need to do it before then to be aware of that process. When you've done it, you say, then I'll, it's got to happen way before. Does that make sense? So that's the focus. Yep. I just wanted to add on, on this kind of idea, that, um, because for me, the skin picking developed when I was an adolescent, you know, and I was very aware of, of that process. And I think that that's why it's so important to be aware of that process. Overlooked and not picked up yep. because my parents, my family just thought, oh, she's got adolescent skin. Exactly, and therefore it's adolescent skin, and therefore, yeah, exactly, I can understand that as well. Okay, let's go for treatment, and then we can ask questions on that if that's okay. So, CBT treatment. Um, I'm going to go through it, and by the end of it, you're all going to be experts. I do like the coaching thing. I do see my job as a CBT therapist is a coaching thing. I see myself as a kind of Jose Mourinho type character. <laughs> But you lot are the world-class players on the pitch, and I'm the, I'm the special one as the therapist. But then, as it goes on, of course, Joe says his job gets less and less, because he doesn't play the game. He doesn't win the Cups or win the title, or Chelsea season ticket holder. So therefore, what happens is, is it's up to you to do that, and you to put all the effort in, and the keeping fit, and the practicing, and things like that as well. So you are the, the world-class players. I'm now doing the Jose Mourinho coaching manual. Okay? Okay, guys. So the first thing is, and probably most importantly, is self-monitoring. It's getting that awareness of, of that process as well. It's, it's probably a really important thing. I can't stress that enough. That for some people, even doing that in assessment, at some level of, of, of skin picking, where I've seen people, between that and when they come for treatment, they say, I did what you said, Simon, I, I did loads of self-monitoring. And you know what? Just the very fact I'm now aware of every single time, my skin pick has reduced massively. Just that process in itself is so important. And it's something which you really need to spend the time on and focus on. So I want to look at ways of doing that, whether you get yourself, if you're working or doing anything, you then use a computer or you have on your iPhone, ways of actually self-monitoring every single time of doing that. Liz, you know the person who, I've been showing her art, one of the things she did, because she was an artist, um, she decided to film herself in the room. So she made, it was a room like this, it was an artist room, and she decided, I'm going to film myself just living in this room all day. And she was able to watch back and look for triggers. So she, it took about three or four hours before suddenly she found herself picking. But she wasn't aware of when she started the processes. But having kind of like cameras around and being in this room all day, she decided it's a project. She suddenly thought, oh my God, it was really amazing. I, was, I hadn't thought that there really are things that I'm aware of that I do and what happens to, to trigger me off. So the, the self-monitoring is really important. The second part we're going to look at is, is the habit reversal itself. Hands up if you've tried habit reversal. Very few, excellent, it's not, okay. Hands up if you're going to give this a go. No matter what Simon says, you're going to do it, okay. This is it, okay. The third thing is actually making it hard to pick. Uh, kind of just environmentally and strategically make it more difficult for yourself to do that. So don't have things really planned and processed. You just want to make that, you want anything you do to take the edge off this, because it is hard, like you say, once you start, you need to try and do that and really kind of look at this. You have to see this as a scientist going in and thinking, right, I'm going to analyse my life and I'm going to find those triggers and find all those things that I do in self-monitoring, making it hard to pick. I try this specific habit reversal technique um, and I will do this and you will find your, your skin picking will reduce massively. Detract and stimulate is really important. So distract and stimulate as much as you can before. You're right once you start, it's harder, but it's trying to do that before, um, at that time. And working on your own specific um, ways of doing that are really important. So you know, it's easy to say, oh, we want to have a bath or things like this, but actually you need to find things for you that you feel are, are, are functional and practical that you're able to do at that time. And then, once you've done that, as with all CBT, it's starting to face those avoided situations again and start to, to get your life back. Because that's why I love CBT so much. Because my aim, when, I mean, um, when I was interviewed for 
head of the whole thing. The question I always remember was, so what's the best outcome? The best outcome of, of what we do is treatment. The best outcome for me is, is improving people's lives. It's improving the quality of your life. It's not, there's always different measures that we use. It's a Y box, there's even specific ones for these things. But actually, we're here to actually make your life a life worth living, which means actually doing all the things that we do as human beings, whether it's going out and being able to be free and have that. So improving people's lives is really, really key. And, and therefore, we know with, with not just BDD, but chronic skin picking, the avoidances get harder and harder and harder and harder to do. I kind of want to tell you a little story. I, I often do home assessments to people around the country. Uh, I did this home assessment in a far fun place in Wales. It took me two days to get to. I didn't realise when you get to the beginning of Wales, it's still another four hours to get across to the other side. You have to go over the... I thought, whoa! So I drove oh, diligently. I think I'll be there by nine o'clock. I had to start off about three o'clock in the morning to get there. Now, and there was, a, there was this 18-year-old person with very severe BDD, and he lived in the house by himself. Well, with his mum, sorry. He lived with his mum. And he was very clear to me, he said, Simon, I'm not sure I want any of this treatment because, look, I'm happy. I've got the computer here, my mum feeds me, I've got a window, here's my bed, this is it. What else do I need? What else do I need? And there was a real kind of, like, fooling yourself. And it didn't take long when the interview for him to break down. I said, yeah, I know. I know it's really difficult. But he had almost accepted that that's it. That's my life. And, and almost accepted that this is okay, isn't it, to, to be here in this, because he'd not known anything else, and because the fear was so much, in some ways as well. He came to our unit, he did really well, and he has gone to university, and hopefully over the next couple of years, he'll come and be an inspirational speaker. But I, I remember driving away, and it kind of really stuck with me, the kind of, because I was absolutely, really shocked at the way he was living in here, but he was like, no, no, this is okay, no, this is fine, no, son, I don't really need it, and he hadn't done this. Of course, we had the same conversation at the end of treatment, he was going, yeah. I hadn't realised that I'm able to do all these things again. So, number one is to have that kind of big hope that you could definitely can. So, why don't I go on to that? I don't know, it was important to me. Stimulation reducers we'll talk about, and also habit blockers, and kind of changing your environment and routine changes as well are really important. So, self-monitoring is all about increasing your awareness of when you do it. So... So that's really important, is to look at the triggers before, the behaviours, the consequences, and actually record your the baseline. I'm going to give you, pass these around as well. Self-monitoring forms. Yeah. There you go. There you go. You're on both sides. This is a complicated one, um, but I would often get people to design their own. It's your treatment. You're good at designing these things. You can actually look at what you need to do in that sense as well. You could use them on the computer, users, iPads, or anything like that as well. The idea is to really try and get, ideally, in my head, and I teach this, you want to try and get, I say to therapists, if, you know, with a client, you want them to, to write down roughly 98% of the time you need. You want to do this. Even if it's in the middle of the night, find out ways of, of, of being aware of the self-monitoring awareness. And the idea is, because if, I, as I said earlier, that you only really start to become aware of it when, something, when it's really bad, when you've bled or whatever, the self-monitoring will increase your awareness and you'll recognise it at an earlier and earlier stage. So it doesn't get to that stage of where you're in that hypnotic trance. You're, you've recognised it much, much earlier. The ideal, sorry, the ideal, I'm aware of time, so I will come back. The ideal stage to recognise this is, let's say you're, you're skin picking here, as I do, the ideal stage to recognise it is on that bit. So I want to recognise this when I'm virtually there, before I get there. For so people with, let's say, it's ear, I, I want to, I, I'm asking people to, to recognise this virtually as the hand goes up to their face. Anywhere in this area, I, I want them to self-monitor so they can be aware of this movement almost, before they even get to here. So rather than being aware of this, it's being aware of this. Because if you're aware here, you've got a chance. So increasing your awareness of that bit. It's being aware of every bit of popcorn is the important thing. So if you want to increase that, you take the popcorn out, you put the piece of popcorn on there, and you look at it, and you decide, I'm going to eat this popcorn and do that, and then you'll be aware, totally aware of the moment of popcorn. I guarantee your popcorn reduction will reduce. We do this with lots of things. We do it with people with um, eating disorders, our overeating as well. Being aware of your eating is important, isn't it? If you want to lose weight, we know by actually eating um, in an environment where you can be mindful of your eating and being aware of every mouthful, it's much better than kind of this buffet, through the buffet, you're talking to people. Before you know it, you've, you've, just, you've just grazed and you've got loads and it's happened. So the same with the skin picking as well. It's actually being aware of every single time. 
Increase that. Okay. And then we're looking at the... So that's really important. You would do that roughly... Um, I get people to do it consistently for a couple of weeks. That's every day, every pick, every going towards it, and really try and do that. It's, it's an effort, but it's worth it. Um, and one of the things I do in training is I get every therapist to try it first of all. Because they all deliver. They all say, yeah, do your self-monitoring. But if they haven't done it the week themselves, they realise how hard this is. This is really hard to do. You have to make sure you've got a pen. So I used to try and find different ways of doing it. I used to make pink paper for girls, blue for boys. I thought that was funny. Um, I would try to make individualised pens, give them all folders. Try it any way you can to make it personalised and more likely to be available. You can do it in such a way that it can have it with letters if you're worried about the kind of embarrassment and shame. You can individualise it so it suits you. People don't necessarily know what you're doing, but you're just kind of keeping dots or shapes or whatever it is. But that's really important. So, the self-monitoring. That in itself will help. Really? Yes. I'm arguing with myself now. Okay. The next thing is the habit reversal itself. So what is the habit reversal? Kind of developed from... These guys, as in none, who looked at habit reversal for various ticks that people did, whether it's like vocal ticks or whatever, and with skin picking, it works away by actually looking for an opposite movement to what you're doing, which is kind of counters that. And the idea is to maintain it. And we say now around about a minute. I think as in none did it for much, much longer, but it's just not practical to do that. So kind of a, a minute that doesn't look odd, that's compatible with your life as much as you can, and kind of gives you that awareness that you're not picking. So, um, if the picking is here, this is Linda, who's one of my brilliant therapists, who's took the pictures on that as well, is you're starting to realise this. So she's at her office, at her desk, she suddenly thinks, oh, what's that on my arm there? She's got, it's su- it was in the summer we did this, and it's the sun coming in, you can see the sun came in, just like, ooh, I've spotted something there. There's a lull, you start picking. Or it could be like, you go to pick in some ways as well. The idea is then, as soon as you realise that you're doing that, you would want to do an opposite movement to that as well. So what Linda did, what, we've, what was suitable for her, and you would individualise it with your therapist to try and look for that, would, would, this is what she was actually doing. Was actually kind of going for the hands out. So it's kind of, we're trying to look for different opposites of the, not just the opposite of the movement here, which is the opposite there, but also the opposite of this, which is like that. So kind of competing that way. So kind of fingers apart, I think it's quite good than this. So it's actually trying to do that. So as soon as you, then you can actually start to recognise when you start to, if you do that, that bit to that bit by itself, <laughs> by actually looking like this. So for her, it was quite convenient to do this because she could stand there like that and look at the window and go, yeah, hi, yeah. <laughs> Didn't actually look that weird, but her hands were apart, which is important as well. So she could do that as well. So it's like, yeah, that's okay, you carry on. <laughs> Any questions? And I'm doing it, but nobody really minds. But you know what? I, I also, I know that I'm going to have an urge. I know I'm going to have that felt sense of kind of that. But I'm staying with that because I've decided. One of the things I find often very useful is to stretch them a bit so you can really feel it here. So you know that kind of tenseness. That's often useful. People, when we, I'm doing this work with people with, with um, quite severe habit disorders like Tourette's or whatever, I really want them to stretch that bit to kind of counterbalance it. So they actually stretch it. So you can feel, I'm now stretching a lot, that I can feel that in my hands. You're all doing that now, please? You can stretch till you feel it. That's really important. And that's what's really key, because just by staying with that, okay, a minute. You often, it's good to do a mindful minute. Do you do a mindful minute? It's a good thing to do. Is roughly, you set your clock and then you turn it around and then you have a mindful minute where you're guess, estimating when a minute is. So mindful, we're not doing a mindful minute now, we haven't got time. We can do a mind, I tell you, we'll do a mindful 10 seconds. We do. So you would do a mindful 10 seconds of estimating. The idea is to try and estimate without counting is good. Of a minute. And then you find, you, you often find you're completely over, by the way. Too much more over. But stretching like that. Another way of doing it is um, actually, this is another way for one hand, is actually just having it stretched out and then kind of just feeling like this, like this. Now, you could, no, Linda could do that. She was there, but she could do that in a session with people. It's actually not, it's not, it's fine. It's not weird as well. So it's, it's that hand that's the important one because that's the hand you're doing the habit reversal as well. But if you do both, then you do that. So for picking, if it's back, then it's as soon as it gets up here, you go, okay, then it will be that way. If it's face, then, I'll, then it's kind of this. 
right behind you, that's often good, right there. And you'll then hold that out. So maybe just stand like this. I'm doing it now. Okay. And you'd be aware, you would, you would do that as close together as you're having the urge. So not even necessarily wait to the movement. Initially, what you may find is you do it because you're, um, if you haven't, if the, if the monitoring doesn't increase your awareness too much, you may find you're, you're, you're picking and then you think, oh, damn, then you still do it. That's okay. You'll make the link, link will be there. You'll pair them up together. It's that link. It's that thing I used to do, so how long I've done this. You know, did anybody used to watch Sex in the City? Yes, we did. I mean, I said, Sex in the City used to be, have an advert of Bailey's in between it. So just the, it used to be Bailey, you know, Bailey's the drink. So, so I know, so, so Sex in the City and Bailey's are always paired for me and my partner. It was always to be, Sex in the City was Bailey's, and you just, you had to have Bailey's, even before the advert came on for Bailey's. You paired the two together. Now, I know there's loads of things, I'm sure, that you paired for that up. It's like classical music now. It's my, my son just, oh, what's that classical music? Oh, that's the, that's the Hovis advert, Dad, all that's that. He pairs the music with the thing. This is what you're doing here, is you're pairing that link and making that bit. It's making it so it becomes really clear. So this movement becomes the opposite. You, in other words, you're putting in that control in that bit. And you can do that. Like that. It sounds so simple, Simon. What do you mean? Is this, is this really it? You've trained for how long to do this? <laughs> really? That's why I sometimes think about habit. But it actually is. It's, it's quite complicated. And, and just like... We said this morning, you do need, it's like learning to drive, you do need somebody to support you and go through the problems and look at these bits as well. But the actual process itself, um, once you get it, you'll be able to adapt it and individualise it and you'll be able to fly with it. But, but the big thing, of course, is the motivation to carry this through and stick with it because it's quite tough. I'm going to take questions. So, okay. Yes, well, you are, I know you both had your questions, so go for it. That's okay. It's good. You go back to the opposite movement again. So, you, so what I'm going to say in the beginning, we know with any behaviour decrease, okay, often there's a behaviour increase. I often do behaviour change in... Um, I, I kind of teach about behaviour change with children or with um, uh, <coughs> children. I say, I say children. So often, if you want to get people to change a kid's behaviour, um, by changing that, their, their behaviour will increase first of all. So for, often, for your behaviours, you may find it increases slightly. Okay. Or you may think, oh, it doesn't work. And that's when you, you mustn't give up. You must stay with it. Okay? And give that a go. I usually say, to, let, let's go for it. We'll test this out, like scientists. We'll test this out for two weeks straight. If at the end, this hasn't made any difference at all, and you've been really consistent, and you've done it every single time, even if it was like, Simon, I did habit reversal 40 times last night. 40 times. Look at my arm. Okay? If it hasn't made any difference at all, I'm going to, I'll write your case up. Because it really, really would it happen if you'd be really consistent. So often here, it's actually saying, right, okay, having the faith in us that this works, I'm, just, I'm not just doing this for a game. This is, I, I, I kind of spend all my life trying to find the right treatments and the best treatments I possibly can for people. That's what I want to do. And I wouldn't be saying this if it was making up or there wasn't the research there or I haven't seen this being as effective. It's been really amazing. One of the things I often ask people to do in treatment is actually, you don't have to show us, but take a picture before the beginning of treatment and take a picture at the end. They can, honestly, it's, it's heartbreakingly, brilliantly, it makes me cry sometimes when you see the difference, especially with people with, with hair pulling, where they may have real huge patches of scalp where they pulled out each hair or whatever. They take a picture, you don't have to show me, and at the end of them, they go to the hairdressers for the first time in 15 years, and they come with their hair, and they can show before and afterwards. And we forget, when we've improved that much, we forget how far you've come that bit. So you need that reminder of that process. It's the same with the skin picking as well. Um, as we said this morning, your skin will improve. Your skin will, will grow, will improve, it will recover. You have to do the habit reversal. You have to give it that chance. So you have to be able to do that. And it really will. And, in, and you know, you can then wear t-shirts, you, you can go to festivals, you could do all that stuff if you put this in. Yes? I don't believe that's true. Yeah. 
and I know that that's really difficult, and I know that's that's, that's yeah. Even yeah. though you've been well all week, yeah. someone just says one thing, yeah. and that can trigger. Yeah. The picking, yeah. And sometimes I, I, that's really really hard, and that, and that it, that does hurt, and that would hurt anybody. Those sorts of things as well, It'd be really difficult. But what I suppose what I want to say is that actually that still wouldn't actually stop you from living the life you want to lead. You have every, every right as anybody else to be on this planet and to live your life and to do those things. So there is that bit about having that strength and also with your therapist to actually encourage you to, 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 to build up that confidence and strength as well to be able to face those things. Because you can and you can do that as well. Okay. You then need to work, I'm aware of time, and I was going to talk about, was going to do a discussion on what makes it hard to pick, distract and stimulate. You have to look individually what that is for you, what type of things you do, whether it's kind of relaxation, whether you prepare an action plan about, okay, when I get the urges, I know that these things help, whether um, it helps if I have gloves, or it helps if I have false nails, or it helps if whatever I do, an action plan of things in place, or I'll make sure I'm not alone, I'll, I'll, I'll call people, I'll, I'll, I'll share this with somebody I know, I can share those bits. You need to make your own action plan about things that make it hard to, to pick, hard so you can distract and you can stimulate. So often, sometimes slight rubbing is useful as well. But the habit reversal is by far the mainstay of what you do when you start to pick, at the very, very first bit of picking, wherever it is, in that sense as well. Okay, so that was it. That's the main thing as you want to do, and it's coming up with what you just said in some ways. This treatment is courageous. You have to have courage to do that. And I suppose I see that's what today is about in some ways. It's so brilliant to have just the very fact that a lot of you are here, I think is really courageous. But what I also know, for every single one of you who's been so courageous in getting here, okay, um, there are probably 10 to 100 people at home who wanted to get here but couldn't. So you lot have been really courageous so far. You're being courageous for those people who can't get here yet. Hopefully, they'll build up some courage and they'll come next year or year before. So now you've kind of made this little step. It's actually, okay, maybe I now need to be courageous with this problem as well and face the things, knowing the difficulties, knowing that I may get abused, knowing that it's going to be really, really hard and, it's, and it may not work the first time, but being courageous is really important. And that's Liz who does all this uh, stuff. She does a lot of art on her skin picking as well. Yeah. Do you think if we stop skin picking, will that stop the symptoms of BDD? Not in itself. It can, it can assist with that, because often the, the bits as well. And we also know that um, improvement... I think this guy called John Teasdale, a professor of, uh, of this stuff as well, it talks about pressing any piano key. So help in one area always helps in other areas. It brings things down as well. But often you would need focused BDD treatment as well if you have BDT, BDD on the other bits as well. But the specific skin scratching and the picking, you definitely can help with, with habit reversal. In David's book, and I hate um, plugging David's book, because he, go, he goes on holiday every year with a resource. But it's great, it's fine. But David's book, um, there is a, 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 not a bad, actually, I have to give him his, there's a really quite, there's a good chapter, on, I'm joking. There's a really good chapter on skin picking. And it's very specific and has little manuals and has those bits in. It's probably one of the overlooked ones, but it's there, and it, it's quite a good bit about the manualised bit about how to do CSP skin pick. It's in David's book. It's also in this manual. It's as well, so that good as well. Yes, there is. They stop picking on me. Yeah, but I'm aware of what I'm aware of. That is that that's really helpful, but that's often there to um, the people who just have CSP by itself, not necessarily CSP and BDD. And in fact, they distinguish between CSP without BDD and CSP with BDD on that website. So they say, we are CSP only as a habit disorder, but not BDD. So that is a useful website, but you need to kind of, this is what David's book does. It's actually CSP within the um, BDD itself. Is that okay? Any final questions? The good thing about um, habit reversal therapy is the success rate is anywhere between 70 to 80%. It's really high. But to be in that bit, you have to be motivated. Just for the skin picking is motivated, consistent, and make it that priority in life as well. I can't stress. I think I stressed that enough, haven't I? Have I nagged enough? Okay. Thank you ever so much. Thank you.